you today on this, my last time preaching for some time here at Bethany. Uh, at this church, our pastors are given an extended sabbatical uh, in every seventh year of ministry here. And since I have just completed my eighth year and in beginning my ninth year of ministry here, I thought it might be time to get around to doing that sabbatical. So this will be my last time preaching before going on sabbatical. I'd actually planned to take the sabbatical a little bit earlier, but some plans that I had hoped for never came to fruition in large part due to pandemic restrictions and other life circumstances. And so tomorrow we'll begin my sabbatical and we are allowed uh, up to five months for that, which includes all our vacation time for the year. And so I thought this morning, before I began my sermon, that I would give a brief report on some of my plans for sabbatical. I recognize that after uh, Pastor Jaron's sabbatical and everything that came out of that, that some of you might be a little jumpy about these things. So I wanted to reassure you that my sabbatical time will be different than Pastor Jaron's for two main reasons. One, I have four children, and that makes it difficult to relocate for a season. And so, by and large, I will be staying around these parts. And I'll be doing some travel, but not relocating my home base. That will remain here. Second, I also have a wife to whom I am married, and very happily so. And so there will be no change on that front. So what do you do then on a sabbatical? I will not be spending months on end gallivanting around the Idahoan paradise with a new love. So what will I be doing? Well, I am glad you asked. Uh, I will be doing some travel for some training opportunities. Uh, tomorrow morning, uh, my wife and I, who is my wife, uh, we will... We will be traveling to Florida, and this week we will be attending uh, what's called the Exponential Conference. Tim and Marcy are already there, and we're going to meet them there and attend this conference together, which is a conference on church growth, church planting, uh, things of that nature. Uh, and so I'm looking forward to that, to taking part in workshops that will stimulate our thinking in those areas. Uh, after that conference is over, we'll be doing some vacationing in the area, and then Kelly will return here. Uh, back home, I'll actually be staying on that side of the country and heading up to Washington, D.C. to participate in a weekender conference up at Capitol Hill Baptist Church. Uh, and this is a great opportunity to go behind the scenes at a church to let you see how they operate everything. This is a church that's very intentional about their uh, ecclesiology, which is a fancy way of saying how they do church. So this, this conference will really be focused on church health and what is a healthy church, and we'll be able to network and learn and all of that, but also to uh, sit back and observe and learn from a church who, who really understands their purpose and lives it out well. And I was actually at this conference in March 2020, and it, the conference had just started, and they came in and said, everybody go home. We don't know what's going on, but you should probably get out of here. Uh, they're right by the U.S. Capitol. They said, we're hearing things, and it could be bad, and then everything got shut down. Uh, right after that. So I barely got to participate, so I'm glad to be going back to that. So <clears throat> I will be gone initially for two weeks, and then I'll return here. Uh, I do have one other uh, travel event definitively planned. That's in April. I'll be attending the Together for the Gospel conference with a friend uh, out in Louisville, Kentucky, and that's a large ministry conference. I think it began in 2006, and it happens every other year, and every year I say I should go to that, and then this year it was my sabbatical, and they said, this is the last time we're doing it. So I said, okay, I'm going to go to that this time. And so that'll have me gone for another week around then. Uh, I'm also hoping to uh, catch a ball game in the area if Major League Baseball can work out its labor stoppage. So if you want some uh, matters of prayer, you can <laughs> consider that. So uh, I do plan to be away a bit more, have some other travels here and there, but nothing definitive at this point. I'm hoping to visit some other churches, other church plants, uh, to talk with them, observe what they do. Uh, I am planning on heading over to Idaho at some point to visit our sister church, Involved Church in Nampa, which is where Jaron is currently serving in his residency, and so I'll be doing that at some point. We'll also do some family vacationing, but for the most part, like I said, I will be around here. You will probably see me here on a lot of Sundays, but don't 
you dare speak to me or look me in the eye. <laughs> no, you can. Uh, but what else will I be doing while I'm around here? During my sabbatical, they want us to rest. So I'm good at resting. So I'll be doing some of that. Uh, I'll be working on some projects around the home. I have a stack of books that I've been wanting to get through, but ministry things distract you from that. So my intent is to focus my study in that area of church planting, which is something that we've been discussing here at Bethany, considering if that is where the Lord might be leading us in our near future here as a church. And I'm hoping through my sabbatical to produce a written plan of what that might look like if we were to do that, and then to begin discussing that further with our leadership team when I return. So I do have one other writing project. I'll be contributing a chapter to an upcoming uh, theology book, which I'm excited about finishing that. Uh, and I can share that with you uh, at some point. Uh, but yeah, so this is all good stuff, all exciting to me, and I really appreciate working for a church that lets its pastors do this. It's certainly an uncommon thing. It's a generous thing, and I think that I will benefit, or that it will benefit our church in the long run. And you might wonder, what will I miss the most while on this time away? And I could be sentimental and say all of you, but I, that's not true. Uh, <laughs> but... <laughs> But that's only because I'm not really going anywhere, right? I'm going to see you anyway. I'll mostly be here. So it's nothing personal. Uh, so, but otherwise, that would be the answer. But I do miss preaching God's word at this church. I will miss that because it's one of my favorite things to do. And you're so kind to listen when I'm up here and opening up the scriptures and preaching the gospel to you and sharing what, you know, I hope is the Lord's will shared through me as we look into the scriptures. And so we're going to do that now. Uh, so if you want to open your Bible up to 1 Samuel 5, I'm going to take a moment and pray, and then we will get into this passage. So let's pray together. Father, we look to your word now, and we trust that uh, the word you have given us in the scriptures is uh, your inerrant message to us, that it contains all that you want it to contain for us to hear from you, that we might be equipped to live godly lives, that we might be taught and encouraged and convicted and challenged and trained up to serve you. And we pray, God, this morning that all of this would happen as we open up your word, as we read it, as we seek to understand it, and that through it, we seek to see your son, Jesus Christ. We pray this in his name. Amen. So today we will be looking at 1 Samuel chapters 5 and 6. And there is a lot that happens in these chapters. And when we last left off in chapter 4, you remember last week the Israelites had been defeated in battle by the Philistines, which was one of the neighboring peoples there in the promised land. And so, in order to bring good fortune to them, they said, we don't want that to happen again. They brought the Ark of the Covenant to the battlefield with them, thinking, hey, this will bring us good luck. But they lost again, and they lost way worse. And this time they lost the Ark itself, and Eli's two wicked sons died. And then they lost Eli too when he heard about it, and he said, oh no, and he fell off his chair and broke his neck when he heard the news. So it was a depressing chapter in chapter 4. It's a down time in the nation of Israel. And it's unfortunate because things had been looking so good and so hopeful. Two weeks ago, we looked at chapter 3 and how the Lord was raising up Samuel and he was returning his word to the people. And you thought, is this it? Are they going to honor the Lord and be obedient and be blessed in the land? And then chapter 4 happens and you say, no, now the ark is gone. The people are defeated. God's visible presence there in that ark is taken in to Philistine country. And we saw last week what happened when the people came back and they told Eli and all of that. Now the scene shifts again back to where the ark is in chapter 5. It's with the Philistines, and this is a good story. You may have heard it before, but let's take a look. We're going to read first uh, verses 1 through 5 to see what the ark of the covenant is up to. So read with me, beginning in verse 1. When the Philistines captured the ark of God, they brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. Then the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it into the house of Dagon and set it up beside Dagon. 
And when the people of Ashdod rose early the next day, behold, Dagon had fallen face downward on the ground before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and put him back in his place. But when they rose early on the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen face downward on the ground before the ark of the Lord, and the head of Dagon and both his hands were lying cut off on the threshold. Only the trunk of Dagon was left to him. This is why the priests of Dagon and all who enter the house of Dagon do not tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod to this day. So this is what happened when the Philistines took the Ark of the Covenant. They take it and they set the Ark up in the temple of their pagan god whose name is Dagon. It says they set it beside him, like in a subservient position, like it was there to serve him. Because you understand in the ancient Near East, when two peoples went to battle, it was not just a battle of two people groups. It was seen as a battle of their gods. So when you defeated a people, not only were you stronger than those people, but it meant that your God was stronger than their God. And since in their mind, their God Dagon had defeated the Israelite God Yahweh, they could now place Yahweh in Dagon's temple to serve him. And I don't even think they really understood understood what they had here. The Ark of the Covenant was not an image of God. It was his throne, right? The Israelites were not allowed to make an image of God, but they don't know all of this. They thought that this was the God himself. And so they put this in the temple to serve Dagon. And they try this arrangement for one night. Dagon falls face down overnight. He is bowing in worship before the Lord who is greater than him. God is putting him in that position. And they say, we don't know how this happened. It must have been an accident. So they set it up. And the second night, it becomes even clearer. He not only falls over, but his head and his hands break off and they land on the threshold. So that shows complete victory by God, taking off the head of something, which is what David will soon do to one of the Philistines themselves is a way to completely defeat a person. And so God completely defeats Dagon. His head and his hands fall off and they land, it says, on the threshold, an area there in the temple. And the Philistines look at this and they come in and they take completely the wrong message from this. Because Dagon's hands and head had fallen off and landed on the threshold, you see in verse 5 it says, this must be a really holy place because the head and hands of Dagon came to this threshold. So they treated it as very holy. So they didn't even walk on that area because Dagon's head and hands had at one point been in that area. But that wasn't the point. The point was that Yahweh had completely defeated their god, Dagon. And they should have discarded Dagon forever and worshiped the true and living God. But instead they said, oh, No, like his hands broke off, his head fell down, he put him on this threshold. He must be telling us that this is a very holy place. And we often miss these signals from God, right? God says something. If we listen to the Lord, it could be very clear, but we take the wrong thing from it. Sometimes we do things that are stupid things or sinful things. And you look in the word of God and the word of God says, if you do these stupid things and these sinful things, there will be certain consequences in your life. So I want to consider just one verse from Proverbs. Oh, I didn't even bring my, I have an outline up here, whatever. Uh, It's my last day. So, but for a while. Uh, What was I saying? Sometimes we do dumb things. The word of God tells us there are consequences to those things. Consider Proverbs 13.3. It's a simple verse. Whoever guards his mouth preserves his life. He who opens his mouth, or he who opens wide his lips comes to ruin. Okay? Simple principle there. A pretty sound principle. It's saying that your mouth can get you in trouble. And let's say you have uh, some, some struggle with this, some problems with this in your own life. You always say what's on your mind. You have no self-control. You can never rein it in. And so as a result, you say something and you offend, let's say, your boss at work. And so you fail to get promoted or you lose your job or you otherwise make things miserable for yourself. And you could read that verse, whoever guards his mouth preserves his life. He who opens wide his lips comes to ruin. And you could read that and say, oh no, I wasn't guarding my mouth. 
And now I'm seeing the consequences of this. I'm coming to ruin. I should repent of this. And I should ask the Lord to help me change this. Or else this will keep happening to me. Or you could say, huh, is this persecution? This is probably persecution why I lost my job. I should keep doing the same thing. I got to be me. You know, I, I, I tell it like it is. That's who I am. And you don't learn the lesson, right? God sends you a clear message and you take the wrong lesson from it. We often do that. And that's what the priests of Dagon did here. Their God falls over. He breaks in half. Say, oh, he must be blessing this threshold. No, the point was stop worshiping false gods and worship the true and living God. So the priests don't get the message. But... Will the other Philistine people, will they get it? Because it's about to get really bad for them. Let's read in verse 6 up through the end of chapter 5. It says, The hand of the Lord was heavy against the people of Ashdod, and he terrified and afflicted them with tumors, both Ashdod and its territory. And when the men of Ashdod saw how things were, they said, The ark of the God of Israel must not remain with us, for his hand is hard against us and against Dagon our God. So they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? And they answered, Let the ark of the God of Israel be brought around to Gath. So they brought the ark of the God of, the God of Israel there. But after they had brought it around, the hand of the Lord was against the city, causing a very great panic. And he afflicted the men of the city, both young and old, so that tumors broke out on them. So they sent the ark of, the, of God to Ekron. But as soon as the ark of God came to Ekron, the people of Ekron cried out, They have brought around to us the ark of the God of Israel to kill us and our people. They sent, therefore, and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, Send away the ark of the God of Israel and let it return to its own place, that it may not kill us and our people. For there was a deathly panic throughout the whole city. The hand of God was very heavy there. And the men who did not die were struck with tumors, and the cry of the city went up to heaven. So we see that wherever the ark goes among the Philistines, things get pretty miserable for them. And we read the one main symptom here, it says, is tumors. They keep getting tumors. And so trying to discern like medical details from ancient texts is often very difficult to figure out what exactly it's saying. And so, of course, there are theories on what exactly this was. Some people have suggested something even like the, the bubonic plague, you know, but it was something visible, something unpleasant that was afflicting these people. And God was sending a message that he was not pleased with this situation. He was not pleased having the ark in Philistine country. And so what do the Philistines do? No, they do not repent, right? They don't repent of their sins. They don't trust in God. They don't swear allegiance to the true and living God. Instead, they say, get him out of here. Get him away. And so like the men of Ashdod send the ark off to Gath, and then things get bad there. And the men of Gath send the ark off to Ekron. And the guys in Ekron are like, how dare you send this over here? We don't want this. Wherever this goes, bad things happen. And again, I think a common human experience here. We are confronted with our sins by a holy God, and we can trust in God. We can turn to him for mercy, for grace, for forgiveness, or we can ignore it and try to push God out of our consciousness. We cannot think about it. We say, I don't want to read the Bible. I don't want to go to church. I don't want to do anything else that will remind me of God, because I feel convicted in my sins. I feel miserable here. So get God out of my life. Because sometimes God afflicts us or allows us to be afflicted so that we will turn to him. But in that, we say we don't want anything to do with him. Just get God out out of here. Like he will go away. It's like when you're a little kid or you have a little kid, if you close your eyes, the thing that you're afraid of won't be there anymore. But it's still right there. It doesn't matter if you close your eyes. And that's not how it works with God. They're like, send the ark of God out of our camp so we won't be responsible to God anymore. But that's not how things work. Again, God may allow or even send difficulties in your life. And his purpose in doing that is to get your attention so that you might turn to him. 
But when in those times we respond by shutting God off and doing everything we can to not listen to him and to pretend that he doesn't exist, we're acting like Philistines because that's exactly what they do here. And next we'll see that they just want to do anything to get rid of the ark. And so now they come up with a plan to send it back. Look at with me at chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. It says, The ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines for seven months. And the Philistines called for the priests and the diviners and said, What shall we do with the ark of the Lord? Tell us with what we shall send to its place. And they said, if you send away the ark of the God of Israel, do not send it empty, but by all means return him a guilt offering. Then you will be healed, and it will be known to you why his hand does not turn away from you. And they said, what is the guilt offering that we shall return to him? And they answered, five golden tumors and five golden mice, according to the number of the lords of the Philistines. For the same plague was on all of you and on your lords. So you must make images of your tumors and images of your mice that ravage the land and give glory to the God of Israel. Perhaps he will lighten his hand from off you and your gods and your land. Why should you harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts? After he had dealt severely with them, did they not send the people away and they departed? Now then, take and prepare a new cart and two milk cows on which there has never come a yoke and yoke the cows to the cart. But take their calves home away from them and take the ark of the Lord and place it on the cart and put it put in a box at its side, the figures of gold, which you are returning to him as a guilt offering. Then send it off and let it go its way and watch. If it goes up on the way to its own land, to Beth Shemesh, then it is he who has done us this great harm. But if not, then we shall know that it is not his hand that struck us. It happened to us by coincidence." So they come up with uh, an interesting plan here. First off, we see again that the Philistines were very aware of what God had done in Egypt during what we know as the book of Exodus. They knew about the plagues. They knew how God had triumphed over the Egyptian gods. Even back in chapter 4, they were terrified of this. But when they captured the ark, they figured that kind of stuff wouldn't happen to them. But of course, that stuff does happen to them. And so they respond much like the Egyptians did. They get to a point where they've had enough, and they say, fine, go. They send God away, and they send him with great riches, with all this gold. And that's just like what the Israelites did. When the Egyptians sent them away, it says that they plundered the Egyptians. They sent them away with great wealth that they took from Egypt. And so it says they sent an offering here. And the offering was weird, right? Five gold tumors and five gold mice, They didn't know what they were doing. They were kind of guessing here, grabbing at straws. This supports the view that what was afflicting them was something like the bubonic plague, that it was spread by mice or rats or something of that rodential nature. But they send this treasure as an offering to appease God, just in case he's upset about all this. And they put this offering on a cart and they have two milk cows pull it and they take their calves away from them. So the natural thing for the cows to do would be to find their calves so that they can nurse the calves. And so they say, if the cows walk into Israel, then we'll know that this was from God. But if they go back to their young, then they'll know that it was just a coincidence. And of course, they set up the far more likely thing to happen as the coincidental answer, which is what we often do, right? We do this sort of thing again. God, I just need some sign. What should I do? Just give me a sign. And so we resort to superstition. You flip a coin or, you know, you draw something or whatever. We do that rather than come face to face with God. The Philistines knew all about what God had done in Egypt. But when they saw it happen to them face to face, and the exact same things were happening to them, and they say, we're not sure that that's what's happening to us. We know that this is how God works. We know that God did this in the past. We know that this is happening to us now. We know that we have the Ark of the Covenant, so there's good reason that God could do this. But maybe it's not God doing it. Maybe it's just a coincidence. But it is not a coincidence. We'll see what happens. God affirms this not only through the cows, but also the way in which the Ark comes back to Israel. So we have one longer passage to read here. Read with me from 610, and I'm going to read up through actually verse 2 
in chapter 7. It tells us what happens when the ark is sent away. It says, The men did so. And they took two milk cows and yoked them to the cart and shut up their calves at home. And they put the ark of the Lord on the cart and the box with the golden mice and the images of their tumors. And the cows went straight in the direction of Beth Shemesh along one highway, lowing as they went. They turned neither to the right nor to the left. And the lords of the Philistines went after them as far as the border of Beth Shemesh. Now the people of Beth Shemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley. And when they lifted up their eyes and saw the ark, they rejoiced to see it. The cart came into the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh and stopped there. A great stone was there, and they split up the wood of the cart and offered the cows as a burnt offering to the Lord. And the Levites took down the ark of the Lord and the box that was beside it, in which were the golden figures, and set them upon the great stone. And the men of Beth Shemesh offered burnt offerings and sacrificed sacrifices on that day to the Lord. And when the five lords of the Philistines saw it, they returned that day to Ekron. And these are the golden tumors that the Philistines returned as a guilt offering to the Lord. One for Ashdod, one for Gaza, one for Ashkelon, one for Gath, one for Ekron. And the golden mice, according to the number of all the cities of the Philistines, belonging to the five lords, both fortified cities and unwalled villages. The great stone beside which they set down the ark of the Lord is a witness to this day in the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh. And he struck some of the men of Beth Shemesh, because they looked upon the ark of the Lord. He struck 70 men of them, and the people mourned because the Lord had struck the people with a great blow. Then the men of Beth Shemesh said, Who is able to stand before the Lord, this holy God? And to whom shall he go up away from us? And so they sent messengers to the inhabitants of kiriath Jearim, saying, The Philistines have returned the ark of the Lord. Come down and take it up to you. And the men of kiriath Jearim came and took up the ark of the Lord and brought it to the house of Abinadab on the hill. And they consecrated his son Eleazar to have charge of the ark of the Lord. From the day that the ark was lodged at kiriath Jearim, a long time passed, some 20 years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. So we see what happens here. The ark of God returns to Israel. There's these cows coming in. There's a cart behind the cows, but there's no human on the cart. God is driving these cattle. He's returning to Israel triumphantly like a war hero. And again, you see here parallels to the Exodus account. After being held in a foreign land, God triumphed over the foreign gods, afflicted the people with plagues, is sent out with great riches, and enters into the promised land. And when he comes in, who welcomes him? It's Joshua, a man named Joshua. And he commemorates the occasion with a great stone. So it's kind of like all of these parallels. And so the Levites come, the ark comes back, it re-enters the promised land, its exodus is over, it's back, the Levites come, they inspect everything to make sure they get it all in order, and they pretty much do everything wrong. First, the cattle that come back, they offer as burnt offering sacrifices to the Lord, which maybe you say, well, isn't that a good thing? Didn't God tell them to offer burnt offerings? Yes, he did, but he also told them how to do it. And the law stipulated that all burnt offerings were to be male cattle. It's literally in the third verse of Leviticus, which is probably the first book that Levites would know. Like their name is right in it. It's written to them and for them. And they didn't get to verse 3 to figure out what they were to offer for a burnt offering. But these were dairy cows, right? We know that they were female. So this shows carelessness. And you think they might be careful after having brought the ark into war and losing it once already. So that's strike one. But more importantly, they treat the ark irreverently. They pick it up, they set it on a rock, and then it says they look into it. So they didn't transport it the proper way. They didn't cover it up like they were supposed to. Numbers 4 or 5 says it should be covered whenever it's being moved. And the people who were tasked with carrying the ark in Israel, they weren't supposed to touch it. They weren't even supposed to see it. But here they are fiddling with it, opening it up, inspecting it like it's a lost piece of luggage, and they're the TSA at the airport. And so in short, they're acting like Philistines. As Peter Lightheart says, act like a Philistine and you can expect to be punished like a Philistine. And that's exactly what happens to them. Although the extent of the punishment is debatable. And you might have noticed this if you were following along while I was reading. In verse 19 in the ESV, it says that 70 people were struck down 
by the Lord because of their sins. Some translations, you might see that it reads 50,070, which is a big discrepancy there. Uh, some scholars have said they think it's more likely that it was a thousand people. And I don't want to get into that. But regardless, the point is they are punished like the Philistines. God brings down a number of their people because of how they treated the ark. So again, what did they do? Do they repent of their sins? Trust in the Lord? No, they continue to act like Philistines. The ark comes to Beth Shemesh. They do everything wrong. They don't follow the word of God. God punishes them. And so what do they do? They say, get it out of here. Let's call these guys at Kiriath Jerem and see if they'll take it. And Kiriath Jerem was largely a Gentile city in the midst of Israel. If you remember when we studied Joshua, the, the Gibeonites, they were the group that deceived Israel into letting them live. And so they were allowed to live and to take care of the tabernacle and all that sort of stuff. They were the primary inhabitants of Kiriath Jerem. So the ark comes to Israel. The Israelites mess everything up. They receive the punishment of God. They don't repent of their sins. They say, get it out of here. Send it back to the most acceptably Gentile place that we can send it to. And we read there in chapter 7 at the beginning that the ark was there for 20 years. And I do think that during that time, it says they lamented after the Lord. The Lord began to draw his people back toward himself. I think they recognized the sorry state that the ark was in. They knew that things needed to change. And it is to those people that Samuel will reemerge in chapter 7 to call the people to repentance. But it takes a long time. It's this 20-year period. But we've worked our way through this passage, and there's a lot to see in this passage. There are parallels of all sorts. And I've pointed out already that in many ways, this is the Exodus revisited, like in miniature form, and with God playing the role of the Israelites in part. And you read it, and you kind of think, like, I've seen this episode before, but I'm not sure. Like, it seems a little bit different. It's like a rerun, but not exactly. It's a revisiting. We have the same God. He's the same as he was. The pagan gods is, are the same as they were. The people are still sinners. So, like, all of the stuff is still there. And we see that although the Philistines knew about the Exodus and everything that happened there, they knew all about it, but they didn't believe it in their hearts because they didn't repent of their sins and turn to the one true God. And we see that that was largely the case for the Israelites too. Even when God returns to the promised land and revisits that whole scenario, they don't submit themselves to the Lord. They distance themselves from him. They're like, we're not so sure that we want God that close to us. So they're revisiting the exodus and the entrance into the promised land. But not only are these chapters a revisiting of the Exodus, these are a foreshadowing of another significant event in Israel's history, which is the exile. And this had not happened to them yet in 1 Samuel, but they had been warned about it. Oh, I don't know what I'm doing here. We're actually on point four. <laughs> but that's it. So this is a foreshadowing of the exile which hadn't happened yet. God had warned them about it. Back in the book of Deuteronomy, when the Israelites were about to enter the promised land, God said, be very careful when you enter the promised land or you might be taken away into exile among foreign lands. In Deuteronomy 4, 26, 27, he said to them, if they're unfaithful and worship other gods, he said, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that you will soon utterly perish from the land that you are going over the Jordan to possess. You will not live long in it, but will be utterly destroyed and the Lord will scatter you among among the peoples, and you will be left few in number among the nations where the Lord will drive you. And again, in Deuteronomy 28, 63 and 64, it says, And as the Lord took delight in doing you good and multiplying you, so the Lord will take delight in bringing ruin upon you and destroying you, and you shall be plucked off the land that you are entering to take possession of it. And the Lord will scatter you among all peoples, from one end of the earth to the other. And there you shall serve other gods of wood and stone, which neither you nor your fathers had known. So before the Israelites entered the promised land, they had these severe warnings that if they acted wickedly and if they worshiped idols, they would be taken in to exile. They would be removed from their lands. 
And after they enter the land in Joshua, we read all through the book of Judges, we read in these early chapters of 1 Samuel that the people of Israel acted wickedly and they worshiped idols and they didn't trust in the Lord. All the things that God said, if you do this, I will send you into exile. And they do all those things. And so what does God do? Does he send them into exile? And the answer here is no. He gives them further opportunity to repent. And then remarkably, instead of sending the people into exile, God himself goes into exile on their behalf. Look back to chapter 4, a remarkable thing in chapter 4, verse 21. You remember when Eli's uh, daughter-in-law gave birth to a son, and she named the son Ichabod, which means like that there is no glory, or where is the glory It says the reason there in verse 21, she named the child Ichabod saying, the glory has departed from Israel because the ark of God had been captured. So she said the glory has departed, which is a fine translation. But if you have an ESV Bible, look at the footnote where it says the glory has departed can also be rendered that the glory has gone into exile. And this is the more literal rendering of this. The glory of the Lord has gone into exile. And so God had promised his people that if they betray him, they would be sent into exile. And then his people betrayed him over and over and over again. And instead of sending them into exile, exile, he went before them and did on their behalf what they could not do. He said that in their exile, they would be made to serve gods of wood and stone. And God was made to do that. And then he triumphed over those gods. He said that they would suffer tribulations and difficulties in these foreign lands. And God is taken to foreign lands, but he brings tribulations upon his captors. And this should have been a sign to the people God threatened them with exile, but when they deserved it, he didn't do it. And for centuries, he didn't do what he said he would do. So was God a liar? Was God all talk and no action? And the answer, of course, is no, because we see here, in fact, that God actually did do it. He did it on their behalf. He was perfectly innocent, perfectly righteous. And when the people of Israel were supposed to be exiled, he said, I will go in their place. He allows himself to be exiled, to be taken captive at the hands of wicked men, to be humiliated. And it was so tragic that the people of Israel mourned and wept and even died when they heard the news. But it was not the end of the story. The exile was not the end. For upon being taken captive and being humiliated, God did not remain humiliated. He triumphed over the principalities and powers of this world. He defeated the devil and his demonic false servant, Dagon. He defied the course of the natural world and brought these miraculous plagues and afflictions without natural explanation. He then left his captors and returned home triumphant, a conquering hero. And here he comes, and the grace of God stares the Israelites in the face. It's as if through his actions he's saying, I told you that if you were evil, you would be exiled, and you were evil, but I have gone into exile in your place, and I have triumphed over that exile. I have triumphed over the world, over the devil, and now I return to you, and I offer myself to you, and I offer my grace to you, and I invite you once again to serve me. My promises remain. I have not revoked the promises, so what will you do? You don't have to go into exile. I already did did it. And what do the Israelites do? They spurn the offer. They act like Philistines. They disrespect the ark. They disregard the word of God and they send God away. Get him as far away as acceptably possible from us. And have we not done that also so many times? Because perhaps you see the connections here, right? God has told all of humanity that if we sin, our punishment will be greater than exile. Our punishment will be death itself. God told our first parents that when they sinned in that day, they would surely die. And God, again, was gracious to not bring about the consequence immediately when they sinned. But at that point, they began that inevitability of death. And it is inevitable for us as well. God has said that the wages of sin is death. 
And we hear God say that. He says, the wages of sin is death, eternal death. And we hear that and we still sin. And we sin again and we sin again. And God comes to us. And he is just and right if he wanted to bring that death to us. But he does not. He waits and he waits and he waits until the point where he himself comes, stands in our place, takes the death that we deserve and that was designed for us. When Jesus Christ, God himself in the flesh, took on humanity so that he could die in our place, so that God could keep his promises and be just by putting the consequences on to an innocent and willing substitute. Jesus died in our place. Jesus was exiled from this life. And when he died, when he was exiled from life, he did what? He conquered over the rulers and authorities of this world and of the spiritual realm. He defeated the devil, removing the devil's power of accusation against us. And then he returned triumphantly as a conquering hero, rising from the grave. And he returns to us and he says the same thing that he was implicitly saying to the Israelites. He says, I told you that if you were evil, that you would die. And you were evil. But I have suffered. I have died in your place. I have triumphed over death and over the world and over the devil. And now I come back to you and I offer myself to you and I offer my grace to you. And I invite you to once again come and live with me and serve me. My promises remain. I have not revoked them. You do not have to die. I have already done it. He who believes in me will never die. So what will you do? Jesus Christ has suffered for our sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. He has gone into heaven, and he is at the right hand of God with angels and authorities and powers having been subjected to him. And he calls us to submit to him, to stop pushing him away, to stop fighting against him, to stop ignoring him and sending him off. He calls us to submit to him, to give ourselves over to him, to appeal to God for the forgiveness of sins through the death and resurrection of Jesus. And when we do that, he is merciful and gracious and he forgives us of all our sins. He receives us into his kingdom. He makes us perfect with his righteousness. He gives us eternal life and the hope of a resurrection just like his. The scriptures say in the book of Hebrews that if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment. Saying, if you keep pushing the Lord away, what can you expect except the judgment that we rightly deserve? But the scriptures also say that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. In 1 John 1, 9. And we have a chance to do that this morning to recognize that Jesus has gone in our place to take the punishment that we deserve to receive by faith all that he has done on our behalf, to acknowledge our sins and to confess them to God and to be assured of the forgiveness that he offers. And one way we do that is through this ordinance of communion. And hopefully you picked up your communion elements on the way and if you'd like to participate. If not, uh, there's some scurrying going on. That's okay. Uh, but we are given this bread and this cup as symbols of the body and blood of Jesus to remind us that he died in our place, that he took the punishment that he had promised to us and that we rightly deserve, and that because he took that punishment, he offers us forgiveness of all our sins through him. And we're called to practice this memorial. And we're called to do this regularly and to look to God in faith as we do it. And so we invite you to participate this morning. But we say a few things about that. This is for those who are believers in Jesus Christ. We're called to come to God in faith to say, no, I will not keep pushing God away. I welcome him into my life so much that, you know, even in the act of eating, it's as if God becomes, you know, into your life in a very personal way. So we invite believers in Christ to do this. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you're welcome to participate in this. You don't have to be a member of this church. If you come from another uh, gospel preaching and Bible-believing church and you can take communion there, then you're certainly welcome to do so here as well. But we would invite you to confess your sins 
to God, to make your heart right, that you might take this in a worthy manner. So let's take a moment to pray silently to God, to confess our sins to him, and then we will share together in the Lord's table. So would you bow your heads and pray silently?